welcome everyone at uh, our seminar. Uh, our today's speaker is uh, Lawrence uh, Lightheart. Uh, so Lawrence did his uh, masters uh, in Amsterdam with uh, Michael Walter, and uh, currently he is uh, a PhD student at the University of Cologne. His supervisor is David Gross, and. Uh, he will tell us about the uh, convergent uh, inflation hierarchy of uh, quantum casual structures. So, Lawrence, the screen is yours. You can start. Yes, that means showing your slides. <laughs> yeah, I think you can see my screen now, right? Yes, it's excellent. Okay, so let me try to get your faces on my other screen so I can hopefully see some reactions now and then. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, so thank you for the introduction, Adam. Um, indeed, I will talk about uh, causal structures today. And it's about uh, a recent paper we put in the archive and was joint work with, with David, who is also in this meeting, and uh, Mari, a postdoc in the group. So um, a bit of the outline of the talk. I'll start with a brief introdu introduction and um, explain like what the actual problem is that we care about uh, and how to describe this. And then I will go on to how to tackle this problem. And some, uh, like a lot of research has been done already in this direction, in particular, um, yeah, inflation and NPO are, are results of this. So I will, I will touch upon that. And we will need something that's called a Definetti theorem, which relates symmetries to independence to in the end prove a result for a new kind of inflation hierarchy that we've developed in the article. So a lot of new terms are on this slide, but I will go through every one of them uh, one after another. So what is the problem we care about? Well, it's actually very fundamental. It's about sort of the difference between correlation and causation. So it's generally not super hard to see whether two random variables or two systems are correlated. But to determine whether uh, they are like one causes the other or the other way around, or perhaps there is a common cause to, to both of them, these questions are actually very difficult to answer. And so what we want to know is, can we look at the observed statistics, so the, the things we can actually measure, and sort of deduce whether something like that can be produced in a causal structure. So we have sort of a hypothesis of how things are causally related. And can we deduce whether that is indeed a valid assumption or not? So this is important in many fields of study. Um, actually, in, in most fields of studies where causal relations are, are important. In particular, you can think of medicine, economics, and of course, physics. Um, and in physics, there is this very well-known and uh, specific example of Bell tests, where also you know, causality is, is important. Oh, by the way, if, if there are questions at any point, feel free to just unmute yourself and interrupt me and ask the question. And then uh, I'll, I'll try to answer uh, to my best ability. Okay, so um, in particular, in economics, people were also interested in this. And this year, half of the Nobel Prize in economics went to Angrist and Imbens. Uh, as is stated, for their methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. Now, they, uh, they looked at slightly different things than we did, but it should sort of signify that people care about these kinds of problems about causal relations. Okay, so let's look at an example. And so I, I'll choose an example in biology. Suppose we have like a Petri dish, Petri dish and uh, we have like cells on this petri dish, and we want to. We have observed variables, for example, the number of alive cells on the petri dish, whether or not there is mold on the petri dish, and whether or not there are many bacteria on the petri dish. And now there be, there can be sort of several causes for each of these uh, observed things. In particular, you can have, for example, the humidity humidity in the room. You can have the temperature of the room, and you can have nutrients on the Petri dish. And then you can devise like a causal hypothesis of which of these, um, which of these variables 
have an influence on which of these observed uh, statistics. So for example, you could say that perhaps the humidity has an effect on the number of alive cells and on mold, but leaves bacteria unchanged, so nothing happens to bacteria. Similarly, temperature might do something with the mold and the bacteria, but not with the cells. And uh, nutrients does something with um, the bacteria and the alive cells. So I've, I'm not a biologist, so this might not be realistic at all, but you know, you can have this causal hypothesis. And the, the picture on the right depicts this assumption. So we can see A, B, and C, and we cannot observe X, Y, and Z in this assumption. But we say that X only has influence on A and B, Y only has influence on B and C, and Z only has influence on A and C. And so this is signified by these arrows. Okay, and now your question can be, well, is, is this a valid causal structure? And can we deduce just from the probability distribution of A, B, and C, whether, whether this is the causal structure that we actually have? Because perhaps we have something like, like this, where you can just bunch everything together and all three of these, um, these underlying causes affect all three of the observed variables. Okay, so, so in particular, can, can we distinguish between this causal structure and this causal structure or any other causal structure that you can think of? Okay, so this particular triangle causal structure is, is very well known and very famous because it's like one of the first non-trivial examples. And it's also one that we can still actually do something with um, on computers before things get too difficult. So classically, this, this was a classical example so far. Classically, we actually know what kind of probability distributions can be produced in this uh, causal structure. And they look something like this. So it, it looks big and scary, but it's actually not that bad because if you, if you look at all these terms, basically everything that it says is that A is only dependent on X and Z, B is only dependent on X and Y, and C is only dependent on Y and Z. And like apart from that, things should factorize. Okay, and this is also what you kind of see in the causal structure itself. Now, it's still a non-trivial question of whether the probability distribution that you see uh, does have a factorization of this kind, but at least you know, we, can, we can say what it's supposed to be. And an example of a probability distribution that cannot be uh, produced in a triangle scenario is this one. We call it the GH set distribution. And we assume we only have like binary outcomes for A, B, and C. So I, I have just zero or one. And we have a probability of one half of everything being zero. So A being zero, B being zero, and C being zero. And then the probability of one half of all of them being one. Right? So we have perfectly correlated bits. And if you stare a bit at the triangle scenario, you realize that this is impossible because this perfect correlation cannot be produced by variables x, y, and z that are independent of each other. Right? x, y, and z should be uncorrelated uh, with each other. And so yeah, they cannot have this perfect correlation so that a, b, and c are also perfectly correlated. Okay, so let's make the transition to quantum causal structures because on the right, we have the same triangle scenario, but now it is a quantum causal structure because we allow these unobservable, these, these latent variables to now be quantum systems. So we have row AB, row BC and row CA instead of X, Y and Z. And now you can interpret these arrows as quantum channels and uh, a, B, and C, we will now call Alice, Bob, and Charlie, as we like to do in quantum information uh, theory. And then Alice, Bob, and Charlie will perform measurements on the quantum states that they receive uh, via these quantum channels. Okay, so in particular, Alice has a POVM, uh, Bob has a POVM, and Charlie has a POVM, and performs these on, and they perform these on sort of the states that uh, get inputted into their system. Okay, so this is the idea. 
And what we now want to answer is... Sorry, so we do not assume anything in particular about those POVMs that they have? Um, not for the moment, no. <laughs> okay. So later on we will, but for now we just have a POVM. We also do not assume anything about the dimension, for example, of row AB, row BC, and row CA. They can be infinite dimensional if you want. And this is actually also one of the reasons why this, this problem is so difficult uh, to, to actually answer, because we don't know anything about these, these latent systems, except for the causal relations. All right. So the, the, the problem we want to solve is the following. So it's a block of text, but I will paraphrase it. Um, suppose you have an observable uh, probability distribution P, we want to know whether there is a distribution P tilde that is very close in norm to the observed probability distribution and such that P tilde can be produced by a quantum description of this causal structure. So in the previous picture, you want to know whether there exists a state, a global state that has these independence relations and POVMs such that you can produce these statistics. Um, at least very closely. And this is also the question that we answer in the paper. So um, there is a hierarchy of semi-definite programs, um, semi-definite program relaxations, such that you can actually solve this problem in by, by letting the hierarchy uh, like converge. And in the end, this will be complete and you can detect any incompatible distribution um, and at first there will be a constraint on the rank of the measurement operators. And I'll get back to that like, later on in the talk. But um, if you increase this uh, rank constraint, then in the end you will capture everything. So in the end, every compatible P can be arbitrarily well approximated by, any finite, by a finite Schmidt rank model. So in the end, by increasing R, you can capture everything. Okay, so the, how do we actually tackle these problems? And the, the first thing to know is that it's actually very difficult and only very recently have things been discovered. So for a long time, it was unclear what to do. And the question was even whether it's decidable at all, whether we can ever hope to solve this problem. And so about two years ago, um, Ellie Wolf, Rob Speckens and Tobias Fritz came up with what is known as the inflation technique. And the idea of the inflation technique is to relax certain independence constraints to symmetry constraints, which can be handled in the classical case by linear programs. And so later on, like about a year later, they showed that in fact, such linear programs, such a hierarchy of linear programs is complete in the classical case, which means that um, eventually you will answer the question of whether your probability distribution, your observed probability distribution, can be produced in the causal structure that you propose. And the natural thing to do then is to uh, generalize this to a quantum inflation technique. So uh, first we, we generalize these classical causal structures to quantum causal structures. And now you can also generalize this inflation technique to the quantum inflation technique. And so Wolf et al. also uh, did this, but the question remains open whether, whether this inflation technique is also convergent. Now we don't exactly answer that question because we propose a slightly different uh, quantum inflation technique, but the ideas that were presented in this paper only, only like earlier this year, as you can see, like at the, at the bottom of uh, the slide, this was a very recent development. Um, so yeah, we, we propose a slightly different way of doing it for which we can prove convergence. All right, so to repeat, given a probability distribution P, A, B, C, we want to know whether there are POVMs, which we call E, A, F, B, and G, C. So uh, E, A are the POVM elements for Alice, F, B are the POVM elements for Bob, and GC will be the POVM elements for Charlie. And whether there is a state that factorizes in this way, 
So a global state that is a product state such that P, A, B, C can be produced by this state. Okay, so this is the, this is the question. Okay, so we want to describe this independence and for that we need these product states. But the problem is problem, uh, product states are a very difficult set to handle. In particular, they are not convex. And so, um, yeah, our, our hope of, of solving this problem directly with an SDP is, is shattered because we cannot, uh, we cannot directly input this independence into an SDP. However, there is a smart solution to this, which was like the cause for, uh, for this inflation technique by uh, Wolf, Speckens and Fritz, that you can relax this uh, independence condition via symmetry. So in particular, these independence relations, so these product states imply a certain symmetry of your causal structure. And the hope is that the symmetry in the end is enough uh, to, to prove independence as well. And the nice thing is that symmetry is actually a linear, linear constraint. So these can be very well implemented into uh, semi-definite programs in particular. Okay, so how does it work? Um, we return to the triangle scenario again as our main example in this talk. And what we do is we copy uh, each of the latent systems. So in the picture on the left, each uh, latent system ha has been copied once. So we have, for example, row AB1 right here, and row AB2 as a copy of row AB, and similarly, a copy of row BC and a copy of row CA. And in general, you can do this n times. So you can get n copies of the latent systems. And now each of the laboratories, so each of Alice, Bob, and Charlie have a choice of which of these copies to measure. So for example, you can choose, uh, Alice can choose row CA1 coming in from the left and row AB2 coming in from the right. And so there are n squares copies of the POVMs. And so for every choice of states coming in from the left or the right, you have a POVM, so you can perform measurements on those states. Okay, so there are n squared copies of these POVMs. But now there is, because we have like identical copies of the states, there is an exchange symmetry in this picture. In particular, so I've, I've written it down in formula form, but like pictorially it will be clearer. Suppose you measure first these inner three states, then it shouldn't matter if you swap out the row AB state for its copy. And so whether you measure this one or this one should not matter. And so if you write it down as an equation, you see that if you change like the second index of Alice, so the, the system that comes in on the right, and the first index of Bob, which is the system that comes in on the left for Bob right here, then um, the outcome of this measurement should be the same. Okay, so uh, if this is unclear, please, please say so, because this is an important property that we will be using uh, a lot. Yeah, because basically these are the identical copies of those density matrices and the measurements are also identical copies of the measurements, yes? That's right, that's right. Can I ask some tiny thing? Uh, do Alice and Bob together decide which copy of the state they uh, measure? Uh, well, you, you could have different combinations. So um, you can also have um, like E12, F11, but then it will not be like a probability anymore, right? So you can indeed have sort of skewered uh, measurements, but um, it's not necessarily clear then what the outcome will be, but it's possible, yes. So they do not decide necessarily. Uh, so this is just like a thought experiment kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I understand. But they always, uh, basically they always measure the same copy of the system, right? To get a probability system, right? Presentation pi prime. And finally, the third one with pi double prime. Okay, so we have actually quite a lot of symmetry in this system. Um, 
And so at first it might have looked like we've made things worse because we've introduced copies which now also have to be independent. But because we have so much symmetry, um, it turns out that actually this is helpful. Okay, and now the question is, we've, we've, we no longer assume independence, we just assume that the global state is symmetric. And can we now decide whether a probability distribution P is, is compatible? And the answer to that is actually yes. So this is done by non-commutative polynomial optimization, which is a very long term, which is also why I will always abbreviate it to NPO from now on. And the idea of NPO is that you have a hierarchy of semi-definite programs. And in particular for the triangle scenario, you can input your probability distribution P, A, B, C and the inflation level N. And what it will spit out is whether or not there exists operators, so P of VMs, and a state such that uh, rho has this permutation invariance over and the levels of the inflation and such that PABC is produced by measuring this state. Okay, so MPO can actually solve this for us. And this was developed also uh, like a while back already by Pironio and Vasquez and Hassan. Um, and so, yeah, this is actually pretty nice because now we can actually solve this part of the problem. So Lorenz, sorry to interrupt you once again. Can you explain once again, what is this end levels of inflation? Sure, yeah, I'll go back to the previous slide. This means that we have those n copies of those states and so on? That's right. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, so a level n inflation means that you have n copies of each of the latent systems. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we have now a permutation invariant state rho, but what we want is that rho factorizes. And so we need to relate these two things, but first we need to, to realize what it actually means for, for rho to factorize, right? Because suppose we look for now specifically at Alice's subsystem, then Alice has two, uh, two quantum systems coming into her laboratory, one from the left and one from the right. And to each of these systems is associated an observable algebra. And so there is sort of a splitting of Alice's system into a left and right part. So, which we will now like denote by this red line. And so there should exist like these left and right observable algebras, which you call AL and AR. And then for operators on these left and right algebras, if you have a product of those, that is how the state should factorize. Okay, so the global state rho should factorize over these left and right operators of such local observable algebras. Okay, so this is what we what we will need and what we will require in the end to uh, if if we want rho to to factorize. This is this is what we want. So we have several to-dos. The first thing is to find a converging STP hierarchy. The second thing is we need to deduce independence from symmetry, right? Because we've relaxed our independence constraints to symmetry constraints, but in the end, we need to show that the symmetry constraints are enough to also ensure independence. And this is done by so-called the Finetti theorems and um, for our specific case, there didn't exist a fitting the Finetti theorem yet, as far as we knew. So, uh, so we developed, developed the correct the Finetti theorem. And finally, you need to make sure that the quantum model of NPO is actually such that we have this factorization of the previous slide um, in, in our observables. And I will come back to this point later on as well. And it's, this, this was actually not a point we expected to be so difficult, but it turned out to be actually uh, uh, very hard to deal with this last point. Okay, but, but let's go uh, through the list from top to bottom. So we start with a fitting the Finetti theorem. Okay, so what do the Finetti theorems do? 
Well, whenever you have a permutation invariant state, um, it tells you that subsystems are generally not very entangled. So let's take a look at some examples of, of permutation invariant states. Uh, the most obvious one is just n copies of some state rho. And obviously this is permutation invariant by just swapping the copies of rho. And also obviously it's, it's separable, it's even a product state. So, I mean, for, for this one, um, no definitely theorem is needed and the result is a bit trivial. And the same could be said for the second example here where you have a mixed state. Um, again, by swapping sort of the N subsystems, the state's permutation invariant. And in this case, you also have a separable state. But there are also less trivial examples. For example, here we have the N qubit GH set state. So uh, superposition of all zeros and all ones. And this is highly entangled, right? This is a very entangled state. But if you look at subsystems, they will be all be equally entangled with each other because of this permutation symmetry that we have. Right? Because as you can see in, in Psi n, um, you can actually swap each of the subsystems and uh, the state will remain the same. And so each of these subsystems equally entangled with each other and therefore not very entangled with each other. So we can actually uh, certify this. So if you take a trace of say the last n minus k subsystems, then what you get out is just uh, a superposition over zero to the k and one to the k. So the, this is a mixed state. And it's in particular, it's a separable state. Right? So it turns out that indeed every subsystem here is separable. And this is the general idea behind these Definetti theorems, that whenever you have permutation symmetry, um, this will imply in the limit that there, there will be some separability uh, in, in your systems. OK, so there exist many versions of, of quantum Definetti theorems. But like I said, uh, none fit our purpose. And there is a reason why none fit our purpose. And that's because there are actually different models for quantum physics. And the most, most people will be familiar with the first model, which is in terms of Hilbert space tensor products. And so let's take a look at what that means. In that case, we associate to each subsystem a Hilbert space, HI. And whenever you take Hilbert spaces together, you just take the tensor products, right? The, the Hilbert space tensor products. I think many people will be familiar with this. And then on each of these Hilbert spaces, you can get observable algebras. And whenever you have a local algebra, you can just embed it into the larger algebra by padding with identities. Okay, so you just act trivially on sort of the other Hilbert spaces. The only thing is that this, this uh, method, this, this way of doing things assumes this Hilbert space tensor product. And it might not be necessary to, to have this Hilbert space tensor product. Instead, we, what the least thing we need is that when things are spatially separated, is that these measurements will commute. Right? So it doesn't matter uh, in which order you do the measurements. And so instead, we just assume commutation in the second model. So we start from the observable algebras in this case. And whenever we combine systems, the joint system will be a larger algebra where there exists like commuting sub algebras. Okay, so this is at least as general as the Hilbert space model and possibly more general. And for a long time, the question was whether these two models for quantum physics are the same. And this was known as Cyrilson's problem. And uh, it was already shown that for finite dimensional systems, they are the same. And then last year, um, there was this famous article, MIP star is equal to RE, which hardly anybody understands, uh, neither do I, by the way. But what, it's, what it told us was that these descriptions are, in fact, not the same. And the second model is more general. So in particular, for infinite dimensional systems, the second model can produce statistics or correlations that the first model cannot. And so. Um, 
perhaps it's 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 better to to think of the second model um, to be more general and also we will like our our SDP hierarchies are more naturally expressed in the second model anyway because what we input to our semi-definite programs are actually these operators and not Hilbert spaces or anything. Right? So we, we have these operators, these observable algebras, and that is uh, how we work in the STP formalism as well. And so we are working in the second model and we also need a Definetti theorem for the second model. And um, yeah, um, the most general Definetti theorem for the second model did not exist yet. And so we had to develop it. So I will just flash it on the screen here. Um, I don't expect you to like completely memorize or, or understand this, this slide, but the, the main idea that I want you to take away from the slide is that, again, if you have many copies, if you think back of this inflation, if you have many copies of the states um, that are permutation invariant, then you will have a separable state. Okay, this is, this is the general idea, the general gist behind uh, these definitive theorems. And in this case, that is also what is happening. Okay, so specifically for the people who are into C-star algebra stuff, we've, we've shown that it works for the maximal tensor product. Uh, before it was shown by Raggio and Werner that it works for the minimal tensor product. And again, this is this distinction between um, like commuting algebras and Hilbert space tensor product models. So we generalized this result. Okay, so that fixes the second point. We now have a fitting the Fanetti theorem and we are left with the third point. We need to make sure that the quantum model um, is such that the observables of Alice Bob and Charlie factorize. Sorry, Lawrence, uh, before maybe you you go to this third point, mm -hmm. can you just uh, tell a little bit about those maximal and minimal tensor products? Um, sure. <laughs> uh, maybe I can leave that until the uh, end. You can also no, leave it you... uh, until, the, like, for the questions yeah, so, at the talk. I don't yeah, know. So I have some extra slides on it. So maybe you can, you can already kind of see okay. <laughs> in the top right. And some of these slides are on, on the distinction between minimal and maximal tensor products. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's quite, it's very technical. So I, I wanted to leave it out of the main body of the talk. Ah, okay, okay. Um, but I'll, I'll treat it in the end if I have some time left. <laughs> okay. So uh, the third point. So let me uh, reiterate what, what we have and what we need. So from the original quantum inflation, of, of the original uh, uh, paper, one gets P of EMs and a permutation invariant state rho. But what we want is that we have these local algebras, these left and right observable algebras, and that the state factorizes over these algebras in the following way. And so if we have elements from each of these algebras, then the right side of C and the left side of A should be together because of rho CA. Oops. Um, and then you can see that here, right? AL and CR originate from rho CA, and so they should be together. And then this factorizes with respect to the right side of A and the left side of B, and with respect to the right side of B and the left side of C. Okay, so this is how the state should factorize if we have these local algebras. Now, the problem is this. The independence property, so these, these, uh, this factorization is defined in terms of observables that we, that we don't have. These are not being measured. So we only have these POVM elements, EA, FB, and GC of Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And it is not at all clear how to construct these local operators from these POVM elements. And in fact, in the article, um, we show, we give an example of algebras for which you cannot construct non-trivial local observables. Okay, so this is a problem that needs to be solved. And we have one particular way of solving it in our paper. And we do it by just 
putting them in by hand, putting in the local generators by hand. So these, these local generators have a lot of indices. I will explain them in a bit, um, but the idea is as follows. We want the operators of Alice. So these are the POVM elements of Alice to be of the following form. So it's a sum over products of these left and right operators. And you can always do this because uh, for some R, if P is compatible, there is uh, like these, these local algebras are dense in the full algebra of Alice. So you can always sort of approximate E, A, I, J arbitrarily closely by uh, sums of this form. So what, what do all the indices mean? Well, let's start here. So E, small e is because of the capital E of Alice's measurement operator. And the L is because it's the left side, so the left algebra. The I is for the inflation index. So um, which copy of row CA is being measured? A is the measurement outcome for this particular POVM element. And finally, alpha is which term in this sum uh, this generator is, is supposed to relate to. Okay, so, so to repeat, um, this, this is an element of the left algebra and then of the ith copy of rho CA. Okay, and similarly for the right one, we have EJR, so the J is now the inflation index for the state row AB. And the alpha is still the same, uh, same like term in the sum over here. Okay, so I will pause on this slide for a bit because sort of uh, writing EAIJ in this way is, is why, uh, why things work in our paper basically. Okay, so we ask MPO to find these generators instead. So instead of requiring like these POVMs to come out of the MPO uh, problem, we instead ask these generators, uh, sorry, these, these local generators to come out. All right. Okay, now an important thing is that in general, you need this, this R, this rank, uh, which we call a Schmidt rank to go to infinity to be able to uh, arbitrarily approximate any measurement operator. But since that would introduce an infinite amount of generators into our semi-definite program, we let R also be uh, a parameter of the program. So you start from R is equal to one and you slowly go up to higher values of R. Okay, so this restricts the kind of measurements you can do, but if you let R go high enough, then in the end, you will capture everything again. So do you have any uh, bounds on this R? We do not at the moment, uh, but this is, this is an interesting question that, we, that we've also uh, yeah, put as an open question at the end, yeah. Okay, so that answers the last question because um, now we actually have these operators of the local algebras, right? So we now know how to factorize, how the state should factorize. And now we can combine everything to get the, the convergence argument. So if the optimization succeeds for inflation level N, then we know that there exists a global state rho that is symmetric over the permutations of N copies. Right, so, so rho is going to be symmetric. That, that is just because, uh, because of the inflation and all the symmetry constraints that we've put into the problem. Secondly, using the Definetti theorem, you can show that if you let n go to infinity, then there actually exists a product state for which uh, the, the statistics are produced. So the Definetti theorem at first gives you a separable state, if you, if you remember from like a couple of slides back. But with some additional trickery, you can actually show that there also exists a product state for which the same must hold. And then finally, you're actually guaranteed to solve the full approximate causal compatibility problem if you increase R 
uh, high enough. So if you let R grow high enough. Okay, now in, in any step, if the MPO problem returns infeasible for a given value of R and a given value of N, then you conclude that, you can conclude that there exists no quantum model of a causal structure with measurement operator of rank R that produces P. So that's again a whole mouthful, but let me rephrase. So if, if the program terminates and says, this is impossible, then for that value of R, you can say, okay, no, there exists no quantum model that produces these statistics. Okay, and then therefore by letting R go up and up and up, you can actually uh, do it for every rank. But there is a price to pay. In particular, this additional parameter R is very expensive, right? Because by increasing R, you also introduce more and more variables to your semi-definite program. And even though semi-definite programs are polynomial in the number of inputs, it's still in practice, like it, it's quite inefficient. Okay, so it becomes intractable quite quickly. And also uh, the convergence is, uh, for increasing values of R and N is non-monotonous. So what do I mean by that? By increasing N, you approach uh, the optimal value from below, but, but by increasing R, you approach the optimal value from above. And so these things don't work too well with each other. However, uh, for a fixed value of R, the converges, the converges is monotonous with N. Okay, so if you fix R, like I said, the Schmidt, if you fix the Schmidt rank, then you can, for every rank, uh, determine the causal compatibility problem. And then by increasing R, you capture everything. Okay, and this is actually, what was our goal, right? So it's, it, this part was mostly sort of the theoretical result that if you increase these parameters um, until infinity, then at some point you will have captured everything. So to conclude, what we have done is we've described causal structures in terms of commuting algebras, and then developed the, the Venetti theorem that, that fitted this model best, uh, which apparently didn't exist yet, and we, we had to do it ourselves. And finally, we showed that then there exists a converging SDP hierarchy for the causal compatibility problem. However, some questions remain. Like Adam already said, we, we are very curious about whether there exists a bound for R or perhaps a scaling with R so that you can say like how close you are to, uh, to basically all possible measurements. But at the moment, we don't know how to do this. Secondly, um, there might be other ways or smarter ways to identify these local algebras. And so we needed these local algebras to be able to say how the state factorizes. And we did that by putting them in by hand into the semi-definite programs. But perhaps there is a smarter way to do this. And if there is, we would be very curious about that as well. And this also ties into the next open question and that is whether the original hierarchy of Wolf et al is convergence, because we have not proven or disproven that, right? We've only sort of defined a new kind of hierarchy that is convergent, but we still don't know whether the original one is convergent. And finally, you can do some numerical uh, methods and some numerical results on this hierarchy as well. Um, we are working on that. So at the moment, the master students is, is working on uh, on this question. So we'll be expecting results at some point, uh, probably later or like next year. It's almost, almost the end of the year already. All right, so I think that, that concludes sort of the main uh, body of the talk. I think I still have a bit of time left maybe to, to uh, talk about these minimal and maximal tensor products, but perhaps let me stop here first for some, uh, some questions. So, uh, Thank you for yes. listening so if there far. Are any questions, uh, you can ask them now. If, if nobody has a question, maybe I can make a comment. I'm not sure whether everybody realized what has happened, but in the middle of the talk, Lawrence said truthfully that we took a result by Reinhard Werner and generalized it. So I've since heard from various parties that this means I can now retire. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> okay, so I don't see any questions. So what, uh, I'm not sure, sure if this is like uh, something I should ask, but what would be those numerical methods in this setting? So what can you check here numerically? Um, so you can actually implement the semi-definite programming hierarchy for some levels of the hierarchy. And so you can fix a value of R, probably just one or two. Ah, and, uh, just uh, test it for some, uh, yes. some distributions, okay. Yes. I have a question. Um, okay, please. Can you hear me or not? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great, cool. Okay, so thank you for the very nice talk, Lawrence. So I was wondering regarding these numerical methods, how hard is it to actually check compatibility for quantum causal models? And like in particular, how hard is it compared to the classical inflation method? Because I know that you can implement that one, like also only for very simple causal structures, right? So not like many variables and stuff. So I would suspect that for the quantum case, it's even harder. So do you have any like insight into this or? So your, your suspicion is correct. So <laughs> the first the first thing is that you already have to generalize from linear programs to semi-definite programs mm -hmm. because we know that we no longer have like polytopes and we just have some convex constraints. And um, indeed, so yeah, it, it becomes inf like intractable very quickly. So think of maybe like inflation level two or something and then even then it becomes very hard very quickly for even like if you, the triangle scenario is almost the best or like almost the maximal thing we can do already, so. Yeah. Okay, so, but you, then you managed to actually implement it for the triangle scenario and. So, so we have not done our, our own hierarchy yet. So we're working mm -hmm. on that. Okay. Um, but yeah, so the expectation is that it cannot be much more than inflation level two and uh, rank equal to two, something like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so anyone else? If not, let's look at those tensor products. <laughs> <laughs> right, so let's see where I have this. All right, over here. So, um, Let's first sort of define what these tensor products mean. And in particular, we distinguish between sort of the minimal and the maximal tensor product. And they are related by like via the minimal and maximal uh, C star norm. So what it means is that you, you first take sort of the algebraic tensor product of, of two algebras, and then you, you have to complete it with respect to some norm for it to become a C star algebra. And the choice of norm will always be such that it, like its value will, between, will be between the minimal and the maximal norm, the maximal C star norm. Okay, and their definitions are as written here. So for the minimal one, you take representations for each of the algebras and take the supremum of like each of these representations and then the, sort of the norm uh, on that Hilbert space representation. Um, and for the maximal one, you do it more generally. So you take uh, any representation of the combined, so of, of the tensor product of the elements. Um, and so in particular, this also includes, of course, sort of these local representations, but you can sometimes do uh, things that are more general by taking like a, a global representation. And so any C star norm will, in, will be in between these two, uh, in between these two norms. And whether you complete your algebra with respect to uh, either of these norms will actually make a difference in some cases. And so in particular, we, uh, so the, the definitive theorem was proven in case for the minimal, uh, minimal C star norm. And we generalized it to the maximal one. And that means we now actually capture everything, right? Because everything is between the minimal and the maximal, and now it's shown for uh, for the maximal as well. Okay, so this was this uh, this is this uh, generalization uh, which uh, David mentioned. Yes, so this, right. uh, for the minimal norm, it was in this uh, paper by whom uh, Werner or someone. Yes, 
Yeah, uh, Rajo and Werner, that's right. Okay, okay, and now this is, okay, so I see what is the point. Thank Maybe you. I can say a bit about a more physical point of view on that, right? So in, in like textbook quantum mechanics that we all learn in undergraduate uh, courses, the defining mathematical object that is connected to a physical system is its Hilbert space. So we start with the Hilbert space. And so if we have a composite system, we take the individual Hilbert spaces and take the tensor product. So that's how we model multiple systems. In, but, but there are other areas of physics where, where you don't proceed this way. Most are uh, famously, there's algebraic quantum field theory, where you do not start with the Hilbert space at all, but you start with a set of observables and you only then impose that observables that are space-like separated, they commute. And, and you see you have a, have a priori a weaker requirement, namely only commutativity and not tensor product of the underlying Hilbert spaces. Yeah, and so now one can ask two questions. A, is there a difference between the two descriptions? And if so, which one is the physical one? And as Lawrence you know, said before, it's, it's been very recently shown that there is a difference. There are correlations that you can model in the commuting paradigm, but not in the tensor product paradigm. Now, this, of course- The infinite dimension. Uh, yeah, exactly, infinite dimensions, but infinite dimensions is actually the least of your problems. There's, you know, various, you know, degrees of how, you know, how pathological things can be in infinite dimensions. There are infinite dimensional systems where, uh, yeah, where, where you still have this minimal tensor product, where you still have a tensor product of infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, right? But then, but then, it, yeah, but then in infinite systems, again, there, there, there are more general ways of combining, of combining local systems to global ones. And the max one is, in, in some precise sense, the most general way of stitching together local systems to produce a global one. And it's, it, it, yeah, it mimics the set of correlations that come, can come out, out of these uh, constructions, for example, from algebraic quantum field theory. And is more general than the take tensor products, tensor them up and work with that paradigm that, that we learn in, in textbooks. And we don't know what is the right one, by the way. No, I mean the. I think yeah, at the so beginning. I was just about to ask: Is there any way to verify which one is? Uh, I guess needed? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe one could make physical. I think there was, a, for some reason, Miguel. For some time, Miguel Navasquez had like his comments to his archive papers were always: "This work is not funded by the European Union," and the project that was not funded by the European Union was Miguel uh, suggesting to have an ERC. A group that would investigate whether there are physically relevant predictions that only work with the maximum tensor product. And so we could have measured the tensor product structure of the universe. But as we all know, the European Union decided not to fund it. So, so we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Write to the European Commission. If they do fund Miguel, he will assemble a research team and find it out. But so far, uh, we, don't, we don't know. Now we know since a few years there's a difference, but we don't know which one is the right one. In any case, definitely holds in either case, as we now know. So in a way now, it's much less important now to find out. <laughs> okay, thanks David for this comment. So do we have any more questions? Someone wants to comment or add something? I don't see. So let's thank uh, Lawrence uh, once again for the very nice talk.